The people that are just working, raising their families, don't care much about politics or don't even like politics, need to start waking up as to what's going on in our country, and particularly in our state. But I think it's important that people realize this is a problem. When the highest ranking member of the Idaho State Senate says there's a problem, might be a good time to pay attention to what he's talking about. This also wasn't the first time Senate President Pro Tem Chuck Winder drew attention to what's happening with influence at the Idaho Capitol. He made it very clear last June, the Idaho Freedom Foundation and those in the State House that follow their lead are becoming a bigger problem. And Senator Winder isn't the only one saying so. The list of legislators, both current and former, who have spoken up against the IFF has grown longer lately, which is one of the reasons we set out to do a series of stories on the nonprofit and their lobbying offshoot, of which there seems to be a lot of overlap. After hearing what Senator Winder said and watching education budgets get cut over a concept nobody could prove existed in Idaho, which was one of the reasons the 2021 session wound up as the longest ever, by the way, we wanted to ask the question, why? Throughout all of last session, we were told it was because of critical race theory being taught in Idaho schools from pre-K all the way to college. Now, critical race theory is a concept that examines how racism isn't just an individual bias, but also how it's rooted in legal systems and policies. It's supposed to be about recognizing it and fixing it with the goal of making us a better country. It's really law school level scholarship stuff though. So is it really permeating through Idaho's pre-K, elementary, high schools and universities? One group was able to convince enough lawmakers to make it seem so, the Idaho Freedom Foundation. I think we need to talk about social justice ideology. It's something it's Idaho's legislature for. did talk about so a lot here. last session. So when people say that they haven't heard about it, well, it's been creeping in for a little while. In some form or another. This indoctrination is, she said, it's like a poison in these schools. Critical race theory makes students feel bad or inferior or superior, sometimes based on the color of their skin. In fact, Critical race theory, or social justice ideology, or the combined critical social justice, was even the basis of an entire bill in 2021. This bill needed to be passed years ago. This has been creeping through our schools forever. Representative Heather Scott claimed a substitute teacher in the Boise area told her this. To kill a mockingbird, she said the message was made clear. White people are bad, black people are innocent victims. And the students were encouraged to believe that there's an endless era of black victimization. However, is reading a book about a black man being falsely accused of raping a white woman in Jim Crow era Alabama really teaching critical race theory? Scott offered another anecdote Historical from the same substitute books. teacher. And, and the books that um, kind of talk about the, the founding of this country, she said it's been riddled with writings um, from third world experiences um, by authors that are completely unheard of, but they are the white, they are a non-white race. Representative Ron Nate suggested his own anecdotal evidence. Happening. This is a school board member seeing it going on in their school. It says critical race theory demonizes white kids for being white. It teaches that whiteness is a privilege and something students should feel guilty about and apologize for. Meanwhile, on the Senate side, there was a struggle to even define it. Do you have a definition for critical race theory? Um, critical race theory is a formal academic discipline. Um, if you were to Google it, you would find abundant um, descriptions of what is contained in it. I've yet to see a definition, and so I wondered if you had one. No clear definition or definitive evidence of discrimination. Can you tell me, give me any examples of actions in Idaho that were, would have violated any part of Section 33138? You know, I hesitate to be specific, having not brought evidence in front of me that I can um, provide documentation of. Despite that, the clerk will unlock the machine and the members will record their votes. House Bill 377, an act relating to dignity and non-discrimination in public education. House Bill number 377 passed overwhelmingly. So we transmitted to the Senate. And made the teachings of tenants, often found in critical race theory, illegal in Idaho. Don't tell me that's not ever going to happen in Idaho. About two months earlier, there was this debate in the House. Why are we providing preschoolers, little developing children, information on how to help them 
with social justice curriculum. A $6 million federal grant for pre-K education in Idaho, the same one approved the year before, was facing the same scrutiny. The goal in the long run is to be able to take our children from birth and to be able to start indoctrinating them. You're voting for social justice ideology to be given through grant money to our little ones. Let's say no to social justice being taught in Idaho preschools. A federal grant is the opposite of caring. But if you ask those who actually worked with the grant? Critical race theory, is that gonna be taught to kids age through zero through five? No. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, it's hard for me not to laugh about it. Brenda. I just want to make sure that people are clear that when we have a three and a half hour program, we are busy wiping noses, making sure that the shoelaces are tied, putting crayons, pencils and scissors into the hands of young children. The grant would have been a big benefit to rural communities and families. Yet enough lawmakers were persuaded, so the attempt to secure $18 million over three years has failed to pass the House. Failed. Twice. On top of that, a gender equity center at Boise State University, multicultural student services center at Boise State University. The legislature cut two and a half million dollars from the higher education budget. University of Idaho, Office of Multicultural Affairs, a women's center. LGBTQA office. Claiming they were no longer going to fund programs they considered critical race theory. We are spending thousands, millions of dollars on critical race theory and social justice promotion in our universities. Boise State took the biggest hit, losing 1.5 million. I think we have um, a lot of evidence that there is um, this is occurring in our colleges. But was there? It's being thrown out there uh, like a boogeyman that we have in our children's bed. And, and the reality is it might scare them, but it's not real. After their budgets were cut, both BSU and U of I hired a law firm to conduct its own investigation into these claims. In both cases, they found no evidence to back up any of the allegations. In short, the entire social justice narrative on which the University of Idaho was penalized $500,000 was a false narrative created by conflict entrepreneurs who make their living sowing fear and doubt with legislators and voters. The thing is, there wasn't really any evidence provided to prove any of these things were being taught in Idaho schools. The Board of Education does not support indoctrination of any kind and at any level, and I haven't talked to anyone that does. So what was the basis for this bad information? Good afternoon, fellow Idahoans. This is another edition of Fiscal Fridays with Fred. Most point to the Idaho Freedom Foundation. College and university budget, and it's significant for a number of reasons. Their website and YouTube channel are chock full of essays and videos. Left wing claiming Idaho schools are chock full of critical race theory. Indoctrinate Idaho kids from cradle to college. With teachers trying to indoctrinate your children. So they're promoting critical race theory, they're promoting critical queer theory, critical social justice. I mean, it's not just in Idaho, and it's not just in our colleges and universities, but it's also in our elementary, middle, and high schools. They even offer suggestions to legislators on how to handle it. And the best way for them to get the attention of these universities that are pursuing the social justice agenda is to reduce the appropriation by the amount of the social justice spending or something close to that. Thus, the two and a half million dollar reduction in university budgets, a small step toward the ultimate goal of the IFF. You know, the thing about the IFF uh, is, is that they're on record as not believing any money should be going to public education in the state of Idaho. And so their goal really is to defund public education in the state of Idaho. I mean, that's clear. They, they are clear. They don't want public education, so they're doing everything they can to ignite fear in an you know, in a unreasonable, irrational way so we can basically you know, dissect it and destroy it. That's quite a shift for an organization that started out in 2009 as a nonprofit think tank dedicated to Idaho issues. I think a lot of people supported the idea of let's have a conservative you know, think tank in Idaho and let's bring the issues forward and have the discussions. And We spoke with Senate President Pro Tem Chuck Winder right before the 2022 session. And he says he's seen the IFF change over the last five years or so. It's become more of a political movement than it was a think tank. Along with an affiliation with the State Policy Network, a nationwide chain of like-minded groups, that transformation coincides with the 2016 creation of the Idaho Freedom Action, the lobbying arm of the IFF. 
which uses the same offices and staff. They bring in uh, uh, different uh, issues that are going on in other parts of the country and say, well, we can't ever let this happen in Idaho. And they go after people that say, well, it's not happening in Idaho. The biggest challenge to me is the impact they're having on individual legislators. Idaho Freedom Foundation can do anything they want to do. But I think when they start uh, influencing the vote of a block of people and those people want an A rating, I think that's wrong. That A rating Winder is talking about comes from the IFF's Freedom Index. The group grades lawmakers based on how they vote on bills and whether that lines up with the IFF's beliefs. A low score might mean you're against freedom. So it's here. Coincidentally. That's being taught down here. Those voices heard the loudest during education funding so debates. We do have this occurring. Happen to have some of the highest scores on the Freedom Index. To promote critical race theory, you must vote against this budget. If they want to rate senators, if they want to rate bills, uh, do it after they've had a chance to vote. Don't tell people how to vote. Do you have evidence or whatever proof that they've actually communicated with legislators in the middle of a session? Well, I mean, I think you can ask anybody around this building. Uh, they'll change their ratings uh, in the middle of a hearing. Uh, they'll send out text messages. They'll send out emails, uh, you know, encouraging and telling people how they should vote. And legislators? Right. Yes, why they're in committees. For Senator Winder, it was enough of a problem to offer this uh, review we of the 2021 session. I think my greatest disappointment is uh, how many legislators are willing to follow the directions of the Idaho Freedom Foundation. That's one of the biggest threats we have to our democracy in our state is we've got a small group of people that are very vocal, uh, that are very aggressive uh, towards anyone that doesn't agree with them. Six months later, the senator still feels the same. Do you believe that they are a threat to the democracy in Idaho? I believe they are because I think if they, if they were an honest broker in this process, uh, they wouldn't be telling people how to vote. Each individual is elected to by their districts, to represent their constituents, not to represent a special interest group. All right, earlier today on the 208, we started our seven investigate series looking into the Idaho Freedom Foundation. We talked about how last legislative session, Idaho lawmakers reduced or refused education budgets in Idaho based on a false narrative of critical race theory and social justice indoctrination being pushed on Idaho students at all levels. It was a false narrative pushed by the IFF, a nonprofit with growing influence at the state house. Influence that cur current and former state leaders keep calling out even today on social media, as we've seen, not just because of the weight the organization carries, but because of the tactics they use. Look no further than the Freedom Index to see their outsized influence. The Freedom Foundation says the goal with this scorecard is to make legislation transparent and accessible, but several legislators say it crosses a line in telling lawmakers what bills to bring and how to vote. Inside this building, the House will be in order. Some lawmakers say the first order of business. Is one organization's opinion causes division in our state. I am deeply concerned and deeply troubled by it. The House will now advance to the third order of business. Have you ever seen this with a nonprofit before, having that much influence on what goes on on the House floor? No, um, they are very unique in that regard. That unique influence comes in the form of nonprofit Idaho Freedom Foundation's most prized project, the Idaho Freedom Index. The Freedom Foundation says the goal is to make state legislation transparent. They say they made the index to show which legislators vote for more government and which support lower taxes, fewer regulations, and more personal liberty. Here's how the index works. In real time, as bills are introduced in the legislature, IFF's analysts rate them and they rate all lawmakers based on how they vote for those bills. Its lobbying arm, Idaho Freedom Action, pushes the same index to endorse bills. The group's analysts score proposed legislation using what they call 12 criteria of freedom. Those mostly fall under the question of, does the bill grow or shrink government? Bills are given plus one or minus one point on each of the relevant criteria. For example, this session, IFF gave House Bill 443 a negative three rating. The bill sets up a fund so Idaho can spend $105 million a year, plus a one-time buy-in of up to $75.5 million, to move government school employees onto the state health insurance plan. In contrast, it gave plus four points to a bill banning mask mandates. 
Then there's a whole formula for calculating legislators' freedom index scores based on how they voted for those bills. Lobbying organizations like the powerful Idaho Association of Commerce and Industry, IACI, Idaho Business for Education, and ACLU of Idaho also post legislative scorecards. Most do so after the session, but like IFF, IACI rates a bill before lawmakers vote. The difference is, rather than a handful of analysts rating bills like IFF does, more than 300 IACI members can weigh in on how they think a bill should be rated. So far this legislative session, these five Republican lawmakers have 100% on the Freedom Foundation's leaderboard. 18 other lawmakers' ratings sit above 80%. That same basic group of Republican lawmakers sat at the top of the leaderboard last year, too. So who cares about this index? We asked your elected officials inside this building if they do. Several told us they didn't want to talk about it on camera or at all. Those who did talk to us said while some of their conservative colleagues care, they don't. Okay, let's see. Keep going, keep going, yeah. keep going, keep oh, you're going, under keep that. going. I'm under the 80%. Tell me if you see it and if I'm skimming over it. There, there you are. Huh. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Yep. Keep going. Oh my goodness. Keep there I am. Oh there you are. Maybe you didn't even make the cut. Oh no, you're <laughs> definitely in it. There you are. There I am. Okay. What is it? Twenty five? Mm-hmm. Twenty five percent? Oh no, this is this year. This is this year. Okay, fifty percent. What does this mean to you? Um it means not a whole lot, um, really, because that's an evaluation by somebody the IFF has hired. And my votes are a, an evaluation that we do after sitting in hours of committee, after talking to dozens of constituents, after getting into the best information that we can. A score is just somebody's opinion of how you're doing. And if the opinion is uh, valid, then I take that to heart. If I think that they're off track a little bit on the values they're putting on the score, that's, that's their prerogative. Multiple lawmakers and former state senators told me a minority of GOP lawmakers genuinely agree with all the Freedom Foundation's policies and politics. Well, they do the Freedom Foundation's bidding. While they feel others are influenced by the index and vote based off of it in order to win the closed Republican primary or stay in power. You know, the problem with our government right now is that people are too worried about keeping their job instead of doing their job. Lawmakers say the organization uses low freedom scores against Republicans who don't agree with them, telling voters they're against freedom if they're rated poorly. Do they serve a purpose for some folks? I think they obviously they do. Um, I've been I've received emails and uh, texts about why why are your scores so low? And Those who support the IFF out in the community are very vocal and, and vicious and to the degree people can duck um, people attacking them on, on an issue that maybe they don't personally feel that strongly about. Uh, I think some people do. Well, Priscilla Giddings has a 100% rating. Former Idaho Supreme Court Justice Jim Jones uh, says Tammy Nichols is a 99%er. The Freedom Foundation and Freedom Action hold lawmaker scores against them to intimidate them and get who they want elected during the primaries. When they don't go along with the suggestions that the Freedom Foundation makes, they end up in election trouble. On the campaign trail, Jones and others say the group runs smear campaigns against those who don't go along with their asks. Idahoans see it play out in texts, robocalls, mailers. I think some lawmakers know nothing about a bill other than how the IFF has rated it. Does that scare you? It scares the snot out of me. Um, that is not how we should be setting policy. In fact, multiple lawmakers say many of their colleagues have the index pulled up on their computers on the House floor ahead of a vote. When the vote comes up on the board and you see a certain amount of red, you say, oh, had a bad score. No matter what the bill is, no matter what the bill is. Legislators admit they're not experts in everything. So it's not unusual to turn to lobbyists and organizations representing members of the business community, for example, for information on bills. But in the end, lawmakers I talk to don't want one organization having so much sway in how Idaho is run, especially the IFF, whose funding is unclear. I didn't hear from anyone who supports the scoring, and those rated highly declined to interview with us. Do you think other lobbying groups, though, have as much influence as they have had? Yes, in, in, in the correct way. 
and it's not what any one group wants. It's what is in the what you truly believe is in the best interest. I have not been elected to fall in line and like a zombie and just do what I'm told according to a score. To get into this aspect of this well, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, between the 501c3 and the 501c4, yep. lobbying arm versus nonprofit. It really is concerning for lawmakers that I talk to, the lack of transparency. IFF and its lobbying arm, Idaho Freedom Action, are getting more and more donations every year. I dug into some tax forms which show in 2019, IFF raked in about $710,000. In 2020, they saw more than a million in contributions, grants, money from its lobbying organization. And get this. Ironically, for an organization that really doesn't believe in the government, a PPP loan. But politically active nonprofits don't have to publicly disclose who donates or where their funding comes from, meaning dark money is influencing policy and political outcomes in our state. Prominent players in state politics say the Freedom Foundation really operates in this gray area. That's what we're yep. hearing over and over again, crossing or at least blurring the line between what a nonprofit can and can't do under federal tax law and state campaign finance. Rules. And it's a wide line, of course. Yeah, it is. And as we did yesterday, we all want to point out that, again, Idaho Freedom Foundation did not want to do an on-camera interview with us for these stories. They would have only agreed to do it if we aired an hour-long, unedited interview with them, and, well, that's not how this works. And if you don't think the way they think, then they're going to bully you, and they're going to target you. Conservatives Chuck Winder, currently Senate President Pro Tem, and Bob Geddes, uh, who held the like same position in the early 2000s, say the Idaho Freedom Foundation operates in a political realm where charitable organizations aren't allowed to dabble. When IFF formed in 2009, Geddes was leader of the Senate. That they have stretched beyond just public information and, and public involvement. He, Winder, uh, and former Supreme Court Justice Jim Jones time. say, IFF endorses candidates and sways legislation through intimidation tactics and through its Freedom Index, which rates bills and lawmakers. So there's an awful lot of lobbying going on by the Freedom Foundation. A lot of organizations have that same problem and, and tend to push those limits. Uh, I know of other organizations who keep score, for example, on bills that are important to their members. And, and I, I don't think that that's significantly bad. But I think it is, if it's carried too far, it's, it's basically extortion. You either support us or, or we'll uh, uh, blacklist you. Republican Representative Greg Cheney agrees they toe the line of legality. Do you think that it is in the realm of a 501c3 nonprofit to have something like this? No, it's, it's absolutely lobbying activity. Uh, I, I think they understand perfectly well that they're influencing policy with their scoring. But I certainly believe that their influence is more dangerous. It's, it's no secret that the Idaho Freedom Action uh, and the foundation itself have a very significant impact uh, on the processes that go on. While he thinks IFF's Freedom Index has outsized influence, longtime public policy attorney and lobbyist Roy Aguirre doesn't think the nonprofit crosses the line with its scorecard. As long as they don't use the magic words of endorse, support, those types of things. The law is very clear in that regard in terms of what the, the, the demarcation lines are between what constitutes political activity by way of endorsement and support versus education. IFF's vice president, Dustin Hurst, claims via email, neither IFF nor its lobbying arm, Idaho Freedom Action, endorse or oppose candidates. He says Freedom Action will occasionally, quote, educate voters about incumbents and candidates' records, which some may interpret as support or opposition, but that's not the purpose. Instead, he calls posts and videos like this constituent education. But Senator Jim Woodward killed legislation giving parents a real say in what schools teach. According to the IRS, tax-exempt 501c3 nonprofits, like the Freedom Foundation, are limited in the kinds of activity they can legally do. They cannot make campaign contributions or campaign for or against political candidates. Under federal tax law, these charities can educate legislators, but they aren't supposed to influence legislation, contact lawmakers, or encourage voters to contact lawmakers as a substantial part of their activities. Although the IRS doesn't define substantial. Winder and several other lawmakers say this is where IFF crosses the line. They say the group's leaders, Wayne Hoffman and Fred Birnbaum, tell some representatives how to vote while they're on the floor. And so there's some coordination there. Pressuring them privately and publicly. 
unlike any other organization. Messaging with lawmakers in their floor debates uh, to get the sound bites they want for further influencing of policy and campaigning. You can ask anybody around this building, uh, they all change their ratings uh, in the middle of a hearing. Uh, they'll send out text messages, they'll send out emails, uh, you know, encouraging and telling people how they should vote. And Legislators? I, yes, why they're in committees. Egoran says the law is unclear around how much time and money 501c3s can spend on lobbying. And it cannot be what's known as excessive lobbying. Because the IRS doesn't clearly define excessive lobbying, the definition is subjective. It's up to the nonprofit to decide and the IRS to scrutinize. Egoran says general rule of thumb in terms of money, nonprofits can't spend more than 20% of their total expenses on lobbying. IFF tax forms show the organization spent more than $17,000 on lobbying in 2020. But with almost $750,000 in expenses, that wound up only being 2.5% of their expenditures. To avoid federal lobbying limits and further its mission, the Freedom Foundation created an affiliate social welfare organization. Also tax exempt, the group's 501c4 Idaho Freedom Action can lobby all it wants. And it can engage in some political campaigns, as long as that's not its primary activity. IFF and IFA share the same offices in downtown Boise, the same staff, and according to Secretary of State records, the same lobbyists down at the State House. So it's a public policy determination that's been made by the federal government that 501c3s and 501c4s uh, can be intermingled. Uh, with staff, with resources, that type of thing. While legal, there's little separation between the two. It's hard to see where one stops and the other starts. And uh, I think they've had a tremendous impact on uh, the electoral process. And uh, there's a lot of crossover between what the Freedom Foundation does in scoring the bills and in what Idaho Freedom Action does in supporting or opposing candidates. To extend their reach, Egurin says, It's not unusual. It is common for charities to set up related organizations. For example, the ACLU, Planned Parenthood, and Sierra Club all have 501c4s. The IRS just requires they be very careful with their accounting and have separation between the two organizations, meaning the charity can't finance the lobbying arms activities that the charity is banned from doing. So far this session, Idaho Freedom Action is among the top 10 highest spending lobbying groups out of almost 600 companies. Five other entities have spent more, with Texas-based Young Americans for Liberty shelling out a whopping $51,000 since January. Young Americans for Liberty was the second biggest spender last year in Idaho, with Idaho Freedom Action following in third. IFA spent more than $33,000 to influence legislation in 2021. But it's not just about money. While other organizations have spent more on lobbying, Cheney says they don't have the same grip on the legislature as IFF and IFA. They understand perfectly well that um, what they're doing is, uh, when they're putting out the social media information and other information that they are affecting not only policy, but also political campaigns in the process. Critical race theory. Some of what they put out to voters is proven flat out wrong. Up to outrageous leftist classroom indoctrination. Like claims certain lawmakers voted to pay for programs pushing critical race theory. And put children first. Public records show Idahoans are also concerned about IFF operating in a gray area. Idahoans filed at least four complaints with the state against the organization over the last two years. The Idaho Capital Sun reports the IRS also received at least three complaints about IFF. Complaints accuse the Freedom Foundation of breaking federal tax laws and Idaho campaign finance rules, with one Idahoan saying in a complaint to the state, quote, they will continue to live in the gray area of the law if they are not put on notice. After an investigation, one complaint led to the state fining Idaho Freedom Foundation's VP, Dustin Hurst, $250 for lobbying on Idaho's higher ed budget without registering with the right organization first. They said he registered as a lobbyist for its charitable organization, IFF, but not IFA, the social welfare organization. It's up to the IRS to audit, to fully examine the truthfulness of a tax-exempt organization's mission. To make a determination on whether excessive lobbying has, has in, in fact incurred. But traditionally, Egurin says the agency has done little on that front 
due to inadequate funding the last couple decades. You can make a fairly strong case from a public policy standpoint, as well as a transparency standpoint, that in fact there should be a, a more clearly defined line between the types of activities that a 501c3 versus a 501c4 engage in.